Thanks everyone for being here, and I'm pleased to talk to you today with uh, uh, Chris and Ian about Jupiter Lab. And we are here uh, really as ambassadors for the rest of the Jupiter Lab team and the Project Jupiter as a whole. Uh, this is a, a huge effort that's been going on for about two years now and has involved many people. Uh, some of the key people are listed here. Uh, and uh, just want to acknowledge also uh, the broader community that's participated in, in a, a wide range of ways in terms of figuring out what do we need to build the vision for Jupiter Lab. Uh, etc. Uh, just a quick outline. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, mentioning our, our user experience testing that we're doing here at JupyterCon that you can participate in. Give a brief motivation for Jupyter Lab, a roadmap, and then Chris and Ian are going to come up and do the majority of the talk with a, a live demo. So we are doing uh, in-person user experience testing here at JupyterCon, uh, right down the hallway here in the Gramercy room. Uh, and we would love your help in improving our software. We have uh, four different activities uh, that you can participate in all day today and tomorrow. You can either just drop in or there's a sign-up sheet here if you want to pick a, a particular time, uh, bit.ly jupitercon user testing. And you can do anywhere from just one activity to uh, all four activities. The different activities take between uh, 15 minutes and 30 minutes and are covering a wide range of things from Jupyter Lab to our documentation, uh, et cetera. So uh, please, please stop by and help us out. So what motivated us to uh, begin thinking about and, and building Jupyter Lab? Uh, in the, the earlier talk this morning, we addressed some of the challenges with the existing notebook, uh, the difficulty of maintaining it, of extending it, uh, the fact that the classic notebook is written using uh, web technology, of many years ago and that that world is moving at light speed ahead. Uh, but, but from a user's perspective, uh, what's motivating Jupyter Lab? So the classic Jupyter Notebook, as you may know, is about more than just notebooks. At this point, the Jupyter Notebook, uh, in addition to having notebooks, has a text editor, it has an in-browser terminal, it has a full-blown file browser, um, and all of these different things are needed for doing interactive computing with data. So whether you're doing data science or scientific computing or machine learning, uh, usually you want to run the computation where your, your data is, and that's often not on your laptop. And so a lot of our users are starting to run Jupyter in a context where the data is not on their laptop. They're connected to, to some remote system. And at that point, the Jupyter Notebook is your user interface not just to writing that code, but to the entire system. So having the file browser, the terminal, uh, all these other things become really important building blocks for interactive computing. And that, so that's really how we've come to think of these different things. Uh, they're building blocks for interactive computing. And uh, the important thing is that uh, the classic Jupyter Notebook is not the only way of assembling and integrating these different building blocks. For example, uh, a, a, a fantastic uh, workflow that a lot of people love is that of RStudio. Traditionally, RStudio uh, allowed you to just edit uh, standalone R scripts and then select blocks of R code to run them in, a, in something like a console, a code console. It's a different workflow. It still uses the same abstractions for interactive computing of having a place to type code, output, uh, et cetera, but it's a different way of assembling those building blocks. And so the original vision for Jupyter Lab from the user's perspective was to provide a more flexible way of working with those same building blocks and assembling them into however you need to be working with your data. So Jupyter Lab is those same familiar building blocks plus uh, the following. So the more flexible way uh, of using the building blocks, uh, a modern JavaScript uh, development environment, NPM-based packaging, we're using TypeScript, uh, our underlying uh, library that we're using uh, for sort of the application level uh, logic is Phosphor.js. We've got a clean model view separation to enable things like real-time collaboration that we'll be talking about. Uh, one of the really nice benefits of TypeScript is that there's very uh, cleanly separated distinctions between public and private APIs. And so we're working really hard to have public APIs that are clean, stable, 
uh, and as minimal as possible while still, in a lot, still allowing you to do the things you need with them. Um, and the whole vision here is that, uh, yes, Jupyter Lab out of the box ships with these default, default building blocks that you're familiar with. Um, but we want to enable other people to go build additional things that plug into Jupyter Lab and extend it in many ways. And then we're also taking the chance uh, to rethink about uh, the, the design uh, of these building blocks, both the visual design, the user experience design, and, and modernizing that aspect of it. So next is a bit of roadmap. Uh, we hear a lot of questions of uh, where is Jupyter Lab today? When can we start using it? Uh, so again, we've been working on Jupyter Lab for about two years now, um, and even a little bit before that, there was a lot of planning. Uh, we've had 69 contributors to date, uh, and this is a little crazy, 1,082 releases uh, of our NPM packages and Python packages already. That's releases, not commits. <laughs> Um, and this is largely uh, due to the uh, semi-insane way that front-end development is happening now uh, with many, many NPM packages. Um, and we, we have fought it and lost, and so we have many NPM packages. Uh, we have around 11,000 commits uh, in the main repositories in the JupyterLab organization. This is already more commits than we have in the classic notebook. So to give you a sense of the magnitude of work that's gone into Jupyter Lab, we're currently working through a series of pre-beta releases. Uh, our current release number is 0 0.27, which is not particularly uh, meaningful. What you're more interested in is the question, when should you start to use it? And it really depends on how adventurous you are. Here's, the, here's my short summary. The current pre-beta releases are fantastic for adventurous users and developers, right? I'm actually using uh, Jupyter Lab day to day when I'm using the notebook, uh, and it's fantastic. But obviously, I'm, I'm adventurous in that sense. Uh, the beta release, which we're hoping to come out relatively soon, uh, we will recommend it for all users. So from the user perspective, the beta release will essentially be like a 1.0 version. But uh, for developers, the beta release will still be for the adventurous of you. Uh, the 1.0 release that we're hoping to get out late 2017, uh, we will recommend for all users and developers. And the main thing we have going on here uh, is really wanting to stabilize these APIs because we will want all of you uh, to go and build things on top of them. And right now we are still breaking the APIs uh, far too often to recommend it uh, for, for general purpose development. Eventually, our plan is to retire the classic notebook. Uh, there's definitely going to be a transition period once JupyterLab 1.0 comes out. We're not going to immediately retire the notebook. Uh, we know a lot of you have built things on the classic notebook, and there's going to be a, a transition there of everyone shifting over to JupyterLab, and so we're, we're aware of that process, um, and it, it will definitely go on for a while. And so at this point, uh, I would like to introduce JupyterLab Almost Beta and have uh, Chris Colbert come up and start to show you a live demo of where we're at today. You're good. Great, Take thank you. Well, good afternoon, I think it's almost afternoon. Is it afternoon yet? Yes. It's afternoon, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Chris Colbert, I'm a software architect at Continuum, Continuum Analytics. I'm also a co-creator of uh, Jupyter Lab. Um, and lately, I've been having the honor of breaking all of the rules and giving live demos on Alpha Software. So I'm going to continue that today. And um, you know, there's some disclaimers there. Hopefully, everything works. We're going to we're going to hope some of it might not. But uh, I appreciate your patience with all of that. Um, so as Brian mentioned, um, Jupyter Lab. What, one of the main goals that we're trying to do with Jupyter Lab is bring all of those building blocks that are in the classic notebook plus some new stuff um, under under one roof. And so what does that mean when we say under one roof? Well, what you're seeing here is JupyterLab. This is live. This is the 0 0.27 release that was released 26 hours ago. Um, and so when you start it, you're going you're gonna to see this. Actually, in fact, if I refresh it, when you, when you first start it, you're going to see a nice little splash screen um, while it loads in the background for a couple seconds, and then it transitions. And so this is what you see when you, when you start JupyterLab. And what you're presented with is the launcher screen, which is basically how you can start all of these separate individual building blocks within JupyterLab. And so I can just click on this 
button here and you know, I'll get a notebook. And this is a, this is a notebook like everybody is familiar with. It you know, starts a kernel automatically in the background. I can do my regular notebook analysis sort of stuff on that. Uh, we have consoles for anybody that's used to a Qt console type uh, development. Um, make sure I get my Python 3 syntax right, which I don't. So it's a regular uh, console. So this is more of a linear type uh, REPL console that you would get in maybe the classic guy Python or Qt console. I can't go back and edit anything or any of that sort of stuff. Um, but it's useful to have, and we'll see more how that ties into the system as, as we go along in this talk. Um, some of the other things we have, we have text editors, just like the, the, you know, the classic uh, notebook or the, you know, the classic notebook text editor. Um, this is a typical code mirror editor. Not much has changed in this between classic notebook and what you see here. Um, we also have the uh, same terminal experience. So this is a full uh, terminal, terminal uh, emulator. So I can actually run Vim in it. Um, I can also exit Vim in it. So. <laughs> So that, that all works nice. And so, so this is nice. So notice I'm, I'm not in multiple browser tabs here. It's, it's, this is just JupyterLab. Um, but when we say we want to bring all those under one roof, this isn't that great of an experience above a normal browser tab if I can only see one thing at, at, at one time. And so what Brian mentioned is that um, something about the Phosphor.js project, um, which I developed, which I created in concert, in parallel with JupyterLab. And what that serves for us is the low-level widget architecture. You know, widget's a very overloaded term. The low-level JavaScript tooling architecture that allows us to build applications like JupyterLab and applications like JupyterLab. One of the things that it gives us is our very flexible layout system, which allows me to take these tabs, drag them side by side, and I can resize them and arrange, really arrange my whole environment here to look exactly how I want with almost unlimited flexibility. So if you've got multiple 30 inch monitors and you want to drag all this stuff across multiple screens, you can do that and you can arrange the system however it makes sense for your monitor and your workflow. And so that's really what we mean by we say we want to bring all of this under one roof. Uh, we don't want to constantly have to context switch mentally between different browser tabs and interrupt, interrupt our workflows. Clean up my screen here a little bit. So one thing I want to show is, over, so I've, over here I've got a file browser, I'll talk about it a little bit in a second. Um, but one of the ways that I can open things, uh, which you can't do as easily in the classic notebook, is I can just drag and drop from my file browser onto my, uh, my page and I can open literally whatever I have in my file system that's accessible to me. And so this is a reasonably complex notebook um, and it exists to show that notebooks are still notebooks. So this is not the classic notebook. We're not iframing classic notebook into JupyterLab here. This is a brand new implementation of the IPython notebook, um, uses the same protocols under the covers, uses the same notebook format. Uh, an important thing to point out is that JupyterLab is not a re-implementation or a new implementation of the notebook format or any of the protocols or any of that kind of stuff. It's just a new front end that exists on top of all of that existing architecture. Um, but what this new implementation has allowed, allowed us to do is more flexibly implement some of the features that lots of people have been asking for. For example, I can expand and collapse cells which we haven't been able to do in the classic notebook. I can also drag and drop cells, move them around my notebook. One of the other things I can do is now that we have this flexible uh, doc panel arrangement system, I can actually drag and drop cells between notebooks. So if you have some notebooks that are just scratch pads of stuff and you want to start drag and dropping to build up more complex workflows, more complex notebooks, um, we can now do that. Uh, one of the features that, uh, that landed uh, just last night, or just in the 27 release, if I right click on this, I can actually get a new view into this same notebook. So this is a, a view, it's actually, that's a bug. <laughs> it opened up on the wrong one. So live software. So let's try that one more time. New view into file here. There we go, this one worked. So I can get a new view into this same notebook. I can drag them side by side. And if, if I've got a really large notebook like this is, and I need to scroll down to the bottom of it to do work in one part of the notebook while stay scrolled up to do view in the uh, different part of the document, I can do that. So anybody that's used to the workflow in like Sublime Text or your editor where you've got a huge document, two of them side by side, I do that all the time. Um, so we have that in, uh, in JupyterLab now. So some of the other things, some of the other uh, features that are in the classic notebook experience that have made its way over to JupyterLab, but in a different form of the UI. Uh, one of them is this uh, file browser um, that I kind of been dragging and dropping stuff uh, around before. So this is also breadcrumb, bre breadcrumbs based like in the classic notebook, except it just exists in the sidebar tab that I can expand and collapse depending on 
you know, how much space I want it to take up on my screen, all of that's um, resizable. You can, you know, navigate your file system just like you would in a regular, um, in a regular file browser. So that should be, um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty familiar to most people. Uh, another thing that we have that uh, now exists in the classic notebook, uh, but again in a different UI form, is a command palette. Ours exists in a side, side panel now, um, so it's searchable and filterable, it's fuzzy search. So basically any, any command that you might want to execute for all the different plugins that are existing in JupyterLab will show up uh, in this fuzzy searchable command palette, which if you don't know what you're looking for can be a lot faster than trying to hunt for it in uh, one of these top level menus. Okay, let's see. So. Now, one of the things that JupyterLab is intended to do when we're talking about bringing everything under one roof, it wouldn't be that great if all we could do was you know, see multiple things simultaneously and work on them independently. I mean, that's good, but it's not great. Uh, one of the things that would make it great is if we can get those things to communicate with each other across the different UI views of the same data models. And one way that we can do that is uh, with our support for Markdown. Now, typically, Data scientists, we like to write a lot of markdown code, like whether you're doing it in the, in, the, in the actual notebook, whether you're doing it in a readme file, you're trying to build the narrative around um, the project that you're doing and around your data. And a typical workflow for that, might, you might be write your markdown and hit compile and then open it up in another tab of your browser, see what it looks like, rinse and repeat. It's a very laborious way of writing markdown because it takes a long time. What we can do in JupyterLab is I can open a new view into this markdown file and I can open it with a markdown preview and I can set these two things right next to each other. And now, as I write my markdown code, if I can type live, as I write my markdown code, my live preview updates. And the reason that it does this is because at the core fundamental architecture of JupyterLab, we've separated our views from our models. So I've only got one model of that markdown document loaded in memory, and I've got multiple views that are pointing into that, that transform that data into whatever representation I wanna see it on the screen. Now this is really cool. So I can write my mark down, it's a lot faster to do it. You know, I can see what it's gonna look like as I'm doing it. One of the other advantages that we have to this is I can actually create a console attached to my text editor now. And I'm gonna run it with Python 3. And let me put it over here so I can see it. And now all these blocks of code in Markdown that typically you'd have to copy and paste into another runtime to figure out if they're gonna execute or not, I can just put my cursor in these blocks of code, hit Shift Enter, and I'll send that code to the console and it'll run, and it'll make sure that my code actually runs correctly before I ever save and commit my markdown files. And so that's the kind of interaction and the linking between the datas and our views and the transformations between models and views. Uh, that, that's really what we're talking about when we're saying bringing all of this under, under one roof. So it's not just how we're gonna lay it out on the page, but it's how these various components can now communicate with each other in the same environment. Okay. So one of the other things that we have uh, on this in terms of trying to make your workflow a bit easier. This type of multiple, multi-pane doc panel layout, that's really cool, because I can see a lot of stuff at one time. But sometimes I want to see just what I'm working on. Like right now, like all I really care about is what's in this console, and I might want to have that take up you know, more, more real estate on my screen. And I can kind of do that manually by starting to you know, collapse some stuff down, but that's a little bit of a manual, laborious process. So let me go back to how I was before. What we've added in JupyterLab is what we call single document mode. So if I'm in a tab that's focused, I can hit Command Shift Enter and go into single document mode, which blows that thing up that I care about to full screen, more or less full screen. Um, you know, if I close my, my file panel here, now we're more or less full screen, but it's, it's kind of like what I'm focused on at the moment. And so I can do what I care about and see, have all my real estate, look at my big plots, maybe interact with some widgets. And then when I'm done with that, I hit Command Shift Enter again and it takes me right back to where I was. So, we're really trying to add the features that allow you as a data science developer when you're interactively working with stuff to work on what you care about and how you care about it in the ways that you want to do it. Clean up some more on my screen here. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the other support for different file types that we have here. Um, so I've got kind of a demo directory set up here and it's got some stuff in it that um, you might find in, in your regular workflow. So you know, we have some images, and I can drag and drop, I can see an image, our image viewer, you can zoom, plus minus, reset. So you know, PNGs, uh, GIFs, GIFs, however you say it, um, JPEGs, whatever you want, the, all those are supported, so standard browser format images, we have those. Um, we have support for GeoJSON, so if you've got GeoJSON files, um, this just run, uses Leaflet to show that immediately. Um, what else do we have? So we've got support for uh, Vega Lite, so I can bring a Vega Lite file in here. And what I like to point out with the Vega Lite, so Vega Lite is just a, a JSON format, right? It's just a, 
a, a plot rendering based on some JSON data. So that means we can actually look at the underlying JSON data at the same time. So I'm gonna open up a JSON editor here, and I wanna view these side by side. And so now I can inter actually interactively introspect the content of that Vegalite plot, because we've got a little interactive JSON viewer. But at the same time, since all of these are actually viewing just the same underlying data model, I can actually open up that JSON file, the Vegalite JSON file in an editor, and I can actually go down here and change this point mark to circle, and in just a couple seconds, my plot will refresh, because again, these are all live linked views to the same underlying data models. So it's not like we special cased markdown files and said, okay, we're gonna have live markdown preview, and whenever you, whenever you edit a markdown file, we'll make sure we update all the views. This works for any file you write a viewer for in JupyterLab. Like, it's something you get for free. It's not, and the, view, the people that wrote the viewers for these, there's no extra code they had to write. You just write a viewer as if it's just a viewer, and our architecture under the covers takes care of making sure everything is synchronized. So you get that for free. Uh, one of the other things we, uh, we use a lot uh, in data science are CSV files. Let's see if I can come out of full screen here. Um, but what about really big CSV files? So on my uh, desktop here, I've got big.csv. It's about a 200 megabyte CSV file. And we might just double click it and try to open an Excel. Um, now I've done this before, this is gonna take a while. Um, and so I'm gonna let it run. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to open up a different file on my system here uh, in JupyterLab called uh, small CSV. And small is relative, it's about 12,000 12, rows. Um, but it opened instantly. And if you tried to do this in the classic notebook, it would take about 45 seconds and you'd end up with a table that has pagers. And you page through a thousand rows at a time and every time you hit a page, it takes a couple seconds to load the next few thousand rows. Um, and the new CSV grid viewer uh, widget that's still in development, so this is still pre-alpha, um, but it's just butter smooth. And I can, I can scroll through all 12,000 rows of this. Um, all of the columns are interactively resizable and there's absolutely no lag between loading the data and viewing your data. Um, so I think Excel is, has done something. It says file not loaded completely. All right, so let's see what it gave us. So I think this is 1.2 million rows. Um, it didn't load all of them because it exceeded uh, Excel's capacity. But as I scroll through this, it's really janky. Um, like, I, like I, would, I wouldn't work with this because it's awful. Um, <laughs> but, so let's try opening this uh, in, in JupyterLab. So this is transferring 200 megabytes across the network, CSV file, and then parsing it and then throwing in a data grid. So it's gonna take a couple seconds. Excel took a couple minutes. Um, but it loads in about eight or nine seconds. And this is, and this is all 1.2 million rows, and there's no perceptible lag when I scroll through this. Now, some of you might say, like, 1.2 million rows, that's not that big. I've got bigger data sets than that. So I have what I call the keep me honest example. And this actually exists as an example on Phosphor.js's page. So the grid itself is a Phosphor.js component. Um, and what I have here, um, I've got you know, five different grids. Some of them have streaming rows. Some of them have ticking data. Some of them are all highlighted based on data values. Oh, let's try not to uh, change page here. Some of them are highlighted based on their, uh, their data values. Um, but the one in the top left corner is actually a one trillion row by one trillion column data set. And I can scroll through that in real time too, and I can also interactively resize the rows and columns with trillion row data sets. Um, so again, this, this grid widget's in development. We still need to add things like selections and editing and, and some other stuff, um, standard features that you'd want from an interactive grid. But the read-only side of showing big data is there and the rendering pipeline and the performance is there. So just more work to do, um, but we'll eventually get there. So what I want to uh, wrap up with here in terms of this feature demonstration, everything that I've demoed today from the terminals, to the consoles, to the notebooks, to the grid viewers, to the GeoJSON, to the JSON viewers, to the Vago Lite, they're all implemented as extensions to JupyterLab that are no more or less privileged than the extensions you would write yourself. We're using the same APIs, the same plugin architecture. Everything that you would want to do to write extensions for your workflow or customize your UIs or your views, like if we can do it, like we use that same API. So really the sky is literally the limit um, and one of the most promising extensions that we have actually working in development right now. Uh, Ian's gonna come up and uh, demo for us, uh, and it's talking about uh, real-time collaboration within JupyterLab, so. Is this, is this working? Okay, so um, one of the most commonly requested uh, features uh, for Jupyter Notebooks is better support for all kinds of collaboration. Uh, as data scientists, we like to collaborate, um, and notebooks have not always had the cleanest story for that 
uh, for, for collaboration. And collaboration can exist on many timescales that, you know, ranging from emailing things back and forth to things that are more familiar to developers like us, like Git-based workflows, uh, to things that happen in real time. And I'm gonna be focusing on real-time collaboration. Uh, I will note in passing that Brian has um, some students who are working on uh, a Git plugin for JupyterLab, which is uh, still in de early development, but is looking very promising. So keep your eyes peeled for that if you uh, like Git-based workflows. Um, but for now, uh, I'm going to be pointing your attention to this tab at the side here. Um, this is a third-party extension that I've been working on for JupyterLab, which gives integration with Google Drive. So you can uh, upload your files to Google Drive, access them from anywhere. Um, but what it also provides is integration with uh, Google Drive's real-time capabilities. These are the things that power Google Docs that, you, that uh, presumably many people have seen and collaborated with, on, uh, uh, with colleagues. Um, so um, central to most uh, collaboration workflows is uh, the idea of resolving conflicts. And that sounds like a bit of a sociological statement, um, but, and it is, um, but, <laughs> but it's also a technical problem. Um, if two people are editing the same document, you're gonna run into conflicts and you're gonna need some way of resolving those. Now with, uh, with Git, frequently, you resolve those manually. Um, in a real-time context, it's much more difficult because um, manually, manually resolving conflicts while more than one person is in the same document is gonna be such a pain uh, that you're pretty much never gonna wanna do it. If the typing experience is such that you're always having to resolve conflicts, uh, nobody's gonna wanna use the tool. Um, so one of the reasons that we're starting out using Google Drive is that it provides, a, uh, it provides an API for resolving these conflicts, um, and that uh, winds up uh, being a good place for us to start in terms of doing real-time collaboration. So I'm gonna start off by opening uh, an example markdown uh, file, which hopefully, so you can see right, right oh, is this the, uh, Yes, I can try to enlarge the font. If I can exit full screen mode. Shift, command, enter. Nope, that's single document mode. There we go. Okay, so this is the this is the, uh, the same split screen that, uh, that Chris de uh, demoed a moment ago, um, but right now I'm not doing any of the editing, so my hands are up. Um, <laughs> but we can see that, uh, we can see that uh, Brian and Chris are both uh, editing this document. If I hover over this carrot, you can see Brian's name shows up, and there's Chris, and they're, uh, you know, I guess, adding various things that we did not plan ahead, uh, plan ahead of time. Um, okay, so this is cool, but uh, you're presumably not here only for markdown files, you're also here to look at notebooks. So um, I'm also going to open a demo notebook that we uh, set up for this equation. Just for some, con for some context, what happened here? <laughs> what was that? Much smaller. Yeah, much, th <laughs> thanks, was that Paul? <laughs> Okay, so um, just for some context, this notebook is a, uh, is a demo notebook I set up that solves the one-dimensional heat equation. This is uh, the equation that prompted Fourier to invent Fourier analysis. Um, so we, you know, I'm not gonna really talk about what it does, except to say uh, that it, you set up, uh, you give it some initial conditions and watch heat flow uh, away from your initial conditions. So if I run this notebook, oh, that's funny. Uh, that, that equation doesn't really look right. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's not the equation for the 1D heat equation, that's the equation for uh, the quadratic formula. Okay, so what I've done here is I've opened up the, uh, the chat box that we've set up for this, and Brian has helpfully given me the correct equation. Um, so the neat thing about this chat box is that uh, this is, these are markdown cells, so I can actually click and drag them into the notebook, and now I have the right equation. And now we'll delete this incorrect one. Okay, so, uh, 
So now I'm gonna try to run this notebook. So I'm stepping through, running these cells, um, and I'll run this last one. Okay, so this uh, gave me an error because it turns out that Brian's laptop doesn't actually have the libraries installed that I wanted. Uh, so, help, so thankfully, Brian just reran it on my laptop, which is sitting right there, which gave the, uh, <laughs> which um, ran the simulation, made an HTML video, pushed that video across the network and showed up right here without me uh, having to run it on this machine. Um, so this is, let's see. Um, and the, the same thing you saw previously uh, in the markdown file is the case here. There are cursors that we can uh, see moving around and editing text. So uh, for instance, we could change the initial conditions to something else and, and see it live update. Uh, there we go. In any event, um, so uh, I would note that what we saw here was two different uh, laptops that were running two different kernels, and that, that was why we wound up seeing um, you know, a different set of libraries installed. Uh, this is one of the things that makes a re real-time collaboration in a notebook setting different from just a plain document setting, where there's actually live computation involved. And there are different models we're talking about for how to actually handle this, ranging for something like this, where you actually do have multiple kernels and people have, can have different types of ex execution results uh, to more shared kernel environments and sort of hybrid, hybrid approaches. So this is, this is all very much a work in progress and we're trying to still hammer out uh, the best uh, ways that, or the ways that are most useful to people. So we're interested in feedback, we're interested in people to play, we're interested in people playing with this and uh, letting us know what they think. Um, and with that, I think I'll invite Brian and Chris back up here and we can field questions. Um, so, so the question was if we ha plan upon having the real-time collaboration available with the first beta, beta release. Um, it's available now for experimentation. I would say it's lagging a little behind JupyterLab in terms of recommended for general usage. I would, I would recommend it more for experimentation right now. Yeah, it requires you to log in through uh, your Google account, yes. So, so we have support, so, so the question is, um, we talked a lot about Markdown, um, and more or less what about restructured text, um, and so, so they're, they're so those are two different languages, uh, essentially, for creating a, a documents. Restructured text is much more complicated than Markdown. Um, so Markdown is really handy for things like where you want to annotate some cells in a notebook or write some readme files where you don't need a lot of complex cross-linking or you know, other, other post-processing of documents. Um, writing a Jupyter, JupyterLab extension that supported restructured text is, is immediately, like you could do that today. Um, so I, there aren't any immediate plans for us to do that as part of core, the core JupyterLab team, um, but that's definitely something that uh, could be community driven. So an another answer to that is that we didn't show in the, the recent release, uh, Ian added a PDF viewer uh, that, that's within the doc panel. And so what, what this opens the door for is other uh, input formats, LaTeX, uh, restructured text that can generate PDF files for us to begin building workflows uh, that involve those other formats and can render uh, the appropriate format, such as PDF or HTML. Um, but again, the important thing is all the infrastructure of real-time collaboration, of the model view separation, all still works with those other formats. So that shouldn't be hard for us or some of you to implement. Matthias. Yes. 
So the question is, what if you're using Jupyter Lab and something doesn't work and you want to go to the classic uh, notebook, what, what can you do at that point? And, and the answer is in the help menu, uh, we have a uh, launch classic notebook that Chris is showing right now that will launch the classic notebook. And it's not showing the tree view here because I'm running uh, a version of the classic notebook that has a bug. Um, a, de a dev version, but that's an issue, a, a bug with a classic notebook that we've fixed in, in the release version of it. So go to help, launch classic notebook, and you've got everything that you uh, have been using so far. Great question, thanks. Yeah. yeah, so the question is, can we talk about the Git plugin? So. Uh, this summer, we've had some interns at Cal Poly, and, and one of the teams of interns uh, has been uh, building a Git plugin. It consists both of a server extension that exposes a REST API to sort of common Git commands, and then a user interface uh, that, that appears in the left panel uh, that basically our, our target audience there is beginner to intermediate Git users trying to simplify the, the daily aspects of working with Git. Uh, so we're thinking very carefully about how to encode the Git abstractions with uh, good visual encoding, um, giving you access to sort of the type of information that you get from Git status and Git log, but with a very nice, uh, carefully thought through and, and designed user interface. Um, and so that, uh, we're getting close to having a release ready of that. Uh, it's not, not out yet, but it's going to be uh, basically a Python package that has the notebook server extension and then uh, a standard Jupyter Lab extension for the user interface. So, and, and we'd love feedback of, about that as well. So. What was that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does it work with Jupyter Hub? Yeah. Uh, yes. The, the answer is yes. <laughs> 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 uh, there are Uh, for for the camera, Steve uh, demoed uh, Jupyter Lab with Jupyter Hub yesterday during the live tutorial. Uh, I think Aaron, you have a question. So those two should be linked since they're going to have a common object on the server. You're talking about Jupyter widgets, so those two will reflect the same state in both notebooks. But there's a lot of underlying JavaScript data structures where you start talking to widgets. So the question is, if you have multiple views into the same file, how does uh, how does state sharing between uh, Jupyter widgets in those multiple notebooks? How is that taken care of? And if somebody in the audience might correct me if I'm wrong about this, but if I understand correctly, um, all of the state that's necessary to recreate the UI for a particular widget is share is actually lives on the server as well as in the front end. And so when one widget changes the state, changes its own state, that state is shipped to the server, which will have which will make its modification and then broadcast those same updates back to any listening views. So then the other view that is displaying the equivalent front end widget for that backend server object will have the same state. Yes? Yeah, uh, Jason Grout uh, over on the right there, I, I can see him sort of smiling and thinking about this. It, in principle, what, what we're saying should be the case. I think Jason is probably hedging a little bit. This was released like a day ago, we haven't had So for the, for the second one, uh, I'll come find you afterwards and we'll make, get it working. Uh, and then for the first one, it's important to note that the, the notebook document format is the same for the classic notebook and for JupyterLab. And so 
the, the rendering capabilities that GitHub has should be maintained. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, so the question is, what about classic notebook extensions? Um, and do they run in JupyterLab? Um, so I, I know Brian mentioned the previous talk. I don't know if he touched on it in, in this talk. Um, but historically, the, the, the JavaScript APIs, or, or the structure of the DOM and the CSS classes that exist in classic notebook kind of became a de facto public API, but they were never intended as a public API. And since they were never intended as a public API, it makes extending and modifications and enhancing the features of the classic notebook very difficult. That's one of the reasons we wrote JupyterLab and rewrote the notebook in the process of that um, is because like we were basically, our hands were, our hands were tied in terms of what we could do with the classic notebook. Um, so the answer to the, the direct answer to that question is that it depends on the complexity of the extension. Um, for extensions that are basically just using um, the, the notebook cell as a host for content that's managed by another library. Um, those, are, those will be very easy to, almost trivial to port um, because all you need is a host node and everything else is kind of, it's kind of like a separation boundary there. Um, but for extensions that are like using jQuery to look up particular parts of the notebook and particular nodes that exist in a cell based on class names, none of that's gonna work because all of that has changed. Um, so the DOM structure itself has changed. And now explicitly our DOM structure is now not a public API and that's enforced with our extension system and with TypeScript. So we give you the APIs that you need to put any content that you want in the right place. That's completely independent of our DOM structure and CSS classes and all of that. So, so the answer is that it really, it really depends on the extension. So, so actually everything that you see in this JupyterLab is an extension. So that, so that, was, that menu bar was populated by extensions into JupyterLab. Absolutely, you can, you, can, you, can, you can add to the menu bar, you can add to context menus, you can add to the command palette, you can add your own stuff to the sidebars, you can add your own document renders. Like, everything that you saw in the demo today is an extension. No, I, I would say not for, not for beta. Um, so we're calling beta as a 1.0 for users. So as a user of JupyterLab, we're, not, we're gonna make sure that the experience that you get with JupyterLab beta doesn't, doesn't change as a, as a keyboard user. Uh, as a developer, uh, we just need, a little, we need until the end of 2017 to settle things down. And, and to give you a sense, we're doing cutting releases about every two weeks, and, so, and we're breaking things in every release. So if you, have, if you can tolerate that level of churn, Go for it, but but it, it's even we have trouble just updating our own extensions right now because there's so much change. Okay. I guess we're out of time. We will be around. In particular, find us at the Jupiter booth. Thank you very much for. Uh, being here.